Good morning, everybody. So today I want to talk about species concepts in action. And if you remember from class on Tuesday, there are three basic species concepts that are most commonly used in biology. The first one is the biological species concept. Remember, if you're looking at two populations of organisms, and those two populations of organisms don't or can't interbreed with one another, we consider them to be separate species. Okay? What is the disadvantage to this species concept? Well, how do we classify asexual species? Most of the organisms that exist on this planet do not reproduce sexually. So what do we do about those groups of organisms? Also, how do you classify fossil species? That's also a problem. You can't see fossil species breeding. So this is, these are two problems associated with the biological species concept. The second species concept is the morphospecies concept. If you remember, if you have two populations of organisms and they look different from one another, then we consider them separate species. Okay, that's the morphospecies concept. What's the problem with this? Is how much morphological difference is necessary in order to call two populations of organisms separate species. It's very subjective species concept. The last species concept is a phylogenetic species concept. And remember, species are defined as the small, smallest monophyletic group, okay? And those that my monophyletic group of organisms share derived characteristics, okay? The uh, species concept is widely applicable, but the main problem with this species concept is that there aren't a lot of evolutionary trees or phylogenetic trees constructed for groups of organisms. We just haven't had a chance to do it yet. We're working on that, but we haven't had a chance to construct phylogenetic trees for all the species out there. So it becomes hard to identify species without a phylogeny. So that's the main problem with the phylogenetic species concept. What do most researchers do then? We have these three different uh, species concepts. They all have advantages and disadvantages, so what do you do? Well, what most of us do as um, evolutionary biologists is we use a combination of all three. So for my uh, dissertation work, for example, I use a combination of the morphological species concept. Do the populations of organisms I'm study actually look different? Okay. Secondly, um, can they interbreed? So I did greenhouse studies to see if two, or two organisms that I thought were separate species and looked different, can they actually interbreed with one another? And thirdly, I constructed a phylogenetic tree based upon more um, molecular data and also morphological data. So I applied all three species concepts, and I think that that's the most conservative and best way to go about identifying species. Okay. So the question that most people have, though, after um, a lecture on species concepts is, like, isn't this just within the realm of theory? Like, why should we really care about what is a species? It's almost asking, like, asking, well, why are we here? Um, is it all theory? Well, but how we define species really impacts how we conserve organisms. So. For example, if you're in environmental studies and you're working to save a species of plant, well, how are you defining that as a species? Okay, how can you protect it? Okay, if you can't define it as a species, so you have to come up with some sort of species concept that you're going to use. Okay, so I want to talk really quickly how um, species concepts actually ended up negatively impacting a group of seaside sparrows. So let's start with the seaside sparrow story. Okay, so let's look at some populations of the seaside sparrow. And this is Amadramus maritimus. Okay, so if you look at different populations of the seaside sparrow, which these four pictures represent four of the six populations of seaside sparrows that are in the United States, um, you will see, if you look really carefully, and some of these photos are not the best, but if you look really carefully, you can see quite a few morphological differences between these different groups or populations of seaside sparrows. And you might classify them differently based upon the morphospecies concept. So I want you to take a second and just think about how you might consider these different populations separate or the same species. 
So if you look at this one um, over here towards the right, you see that this one is blacker in color. He's got a lot of modeling on his um, chest. And you can see just a little teeny tiny bit of yellow right here, right in front of his eye, but at the top of his beak. Here you can see another population of organisms, and here this one is a little bit browner, not as black, and it's got more of a yellowish um, distinct stripe here at the base um, of its eye. So there are lots of little differences here, and most zoologists have recognized those differences, not as species differences, but as subspecies differences. So if you look at the classic um, way that investigators have defined species um, or uh, populations of organisms in this species, they've classically said, okay, well, there's um, Amadramus maritimus subspecies maritima, subspecies Macrolavrii, subspecies Negrescens, Peninsulae, Junicola, Fisheri, etc., and so forth. And most people were pretty satisfied with this until this species right here, Nigrescens, became endangered. Nigrescens occurs right here along the Atlantic coast in one of the most popular tourist destinations in Florida. And so this population of organisms was in serious danger okay, from, uh, from development. In fact, it was left with only um, nine individuals and all of these individuals were males. Okay, so there were no females left in the population of organisms, and they were like, okay, Nigrescens is about to go extinct, so we need to do something about this. Well, unfortunately, the Endangered Species Program, as, it's cur as it currently exists, really only saves species. It doesn't save sub subspecies. In fact, if I quote directly from the um, from the endangered species law, the thing that one of the quotations is the term species includes any subspecies of fish or wildlife or plants and any distinct population segment of any species or vertebrate of vertebrate fish or wildlife which interbreeds in nature. So they're using the biological species concept to define species according to the Endangered Species Act. So what um, scientists started to do was, okay, we've got to save this thing, so can we legitimately classify these different populations that are classified as subspecies right now as species? And they went in and they looked at these guys and they said, well, you know what? They very rarely interbreed. There, tend to be, there tends to be um, a break in their ranges, and so they're very rarely, rarely interbreeding, and so let's call these things species. So they immediately started up um, uh, a program. They, they contacted the government. They said, okay, this is an endangered group. Um, we're classifying it as a species, and we need to make every effort to save this species. And they were in a rush. These guys, there were only nine males left of this population of organisms, so they were in a rush. And so they did what they thought made sense. They said, well, the two populations at the southernmost part of the range, Nigrescens and Peninsulae, look the, very similar to one another, and they live very close to one another. And so they started up a breeding program, and they said, okay, we're going to start breeding these nigres this Nigrescens population with the uh, females in the Peninsulae population, and maybe we'll be able to save some of the genetic characteristics of Nigrescens. Okay, so they started up a breeding program. At the same time that this was going on, there was a group of systematists who um, decided that they were going to construct a phylogenetic tree based upon molecular data. And they looked at, they took samples from all the different populations of the seaside sparrow, they looked at their genes, and they found out that really there are phylogenetically two species of the seaside sparrow. There's an Atlantic coast species, which includes Merit Maritima, McGrill, excuse me, Megillavrii, Nigrescens, and then a Gulf Coast species, which includes Peninsulae, Junicola, and Fisheri. Unfortunately, what had happened is the breeding efforts were happening between, by the uh, conservation biologists, between Nigrescens and Peninsulae, which means that they were breeding individuals from two separate species. And I want you to think back 
and think about what is it that gene flow does to two populations of organisms. And if you remember, what it usually does is it homogenizes those um, two groups of organisms. So in a way, they are hybridizing these two species and actually instead of maintaining genetic diversity in the Nigrosins population, they actually decrease gen genetic diversity in this population. So this is a problem. Um, you know, they, uh, if we, they were under pressure. The conservation biologists were under pressure. But, you know, really it is information from all three of these species concepts that should be applied in determining what is a species because you literally can impact the survival of a group of organisms by choosing the wrong species concept or, for our, in my opinion, just choosing one species concept and ignoring the others. Okay. So then that ends the the topic for this uh, this 10 minute video and so I'm going to talk about how is it that these two species of organisms, this Atlantic Coast species and this Gulf Coast species of seaside sparrows, how is it that they became different? What happened? How did speciation occur in this group of organisms? So we're going to talk about mechanisms of speciation in the next video. Take care.